I've got good news for you this morning. The scripture for our sermon is only for those who dare to spend a few moments thinking about stuff they don't have to. So if you're not interested in thinking about stuff that you don't need to think about when it comes to how you're going to survive today, you can just tune out. Um, but if you dare, like the psalmist, to introspect a bit and Godtrospect a bit, I just... I created that word just for the sermon, <laughs> introspection and god introspection. But that's kind of what I think is happening in this Psalm 139. If you're interested in, you're like, well, I'm already here, might as well, might, might as well do some of this, uh, this stuff. If you're willing to have your brain hurt a little bit, if you're willing to feel a tiny bit or maybe more than a tiny bit exposed and vulnerable, and... You can see that what might come at the end of this would be some of that comfort and companionship that you might need, that you might be yearning for in the deepest parts of your spirit, then, um, then I think we're going to have a good time together over these next 15 to 22 minutes, <laughs> depending, depending on how many rabbit trails I go down. But I, I do think that there's something about this passage for me as I've been saturating in it over this week. And I pray for you that there's something about it that might be a spark to ignite something in each of us that maybe uh, has just become dampened or numbed a bit over time. So here's, uh, here's the verses we're going to read. It's out of Psalm 139. I'm going to start with verses 1 through 6. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. We do that a lot at Christ by the Sea. There's a lot of sitting down and rising up. The Lord has seen every one of those times. Also, it's, the psalmist says, you discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Now I want to move to verse 13 and read through verse 18. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. There, side little note here. There was kind of an ancient thinking that human beings were kind of formed. God actually formed people like in the core of the earth. And then they were sort of implanted in women's bodies. It's a whole thing. But, but that's the language that's being referenced there. Trying to say that it was God who has done this forming in the depths of the earth of each person. Then verse 16. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end, and I am still with you. We ask this morning that God would add blessing and understanding to this, the reading aloud, the hearing, and most importantly for us, that God would bless the living out of these words of Scripture. So let's, let's uh, kind of ease into the difficult thinking by thinking about a, uh, a group of people with whom we are familiar, at least most of us are familiar with their regular kind of uh, poking and prodding and searching and knowing of who we are routinely, and that is our doctors. They say, let me get your height, your weight, let me put a stethoscope here on your heart. Let me put it on your back and listen to your lungs. Let me take a microscope and look into your ear and your throat. Let me ask you a bunch of questions about your pains, your diets, your stresses, your exercise or lack thereof. You know, if you think beyond your general practitioner doctor, maybe you think about a dentist. When was the last time you flossed? Uh, or somebody said out loud, I think, the answer I was thinking, which is six months ago when I was here last. Um, 
When we think about any of the doctors that we might visit in our, our life and their work of really trying to search and know us, maybe finding out things that are going on in us that we had no idea were, and maybe us revealing to them things that we might not reveal to anyone else. We wonder why in the world do they want to search and measure and prod and ask so much? Why are doctors doing their doctor thing anyway? Back off of me. And the doctor might say, well, one, you came to me. Two, I'm here to help. I do all this searching and knowing because I want you to have health. I want you to have a full life. So I wonder why it is in the midst of a doctor's questioning or, or even just kind of the lead up to go see a doctor, the scheduling of it and then the following through by going when, it's, uh, when, when we've had it and then when we get there and they do all the, the questions and the measuring and all that sort of thing. Why is it for some of us, maybe it's many of us who have even felt the temptation, but some of us have actually succumbed to it at different points. Why, if we believe that all their searching and knowing is to help us, do we evade? Is it shame? Is it fear? You know, kind of like if I don't know something is going wrong, then maybe it's really not going wrong. There's any number of reasons to our detriment that we might uh, duck and dodge. But if we remember that their whole work is oriented toward helping us, then we go through some of that uncomfortability and we go through that vulnerability. We trust and we see, ah, this, this bit about you knowing more about me is ultimately to help me, isn't it? It's to make my life better. So when the psalmist starts, O oh Lord, you have searched and known me. Maybe it's best if we approach those initial words with the mindset of somebody who trusts their care provider or their care team. Oh boy, you're going to see I haven't flossed in six months, aren't you, Lord? You've searched and you've known me. You've seen the thought, that, that angry thoughts that I've had. You've seen the fearful ones. You've seen my actions. You've seen at times where I've been on my best, my A game, and you've seen those other times, not so much. What, what Psalm 139 presents, and really we see this throughout the majority of the Bible, is that when it comes to your life and mine, with God, there aren't any surprises. God is not just seeing it all, but is kind of right there in the thick of it all. There's no blind spots. God, when God sees in the searching and knowing of us and sees the good stuff, sees the best of us, God smiles and rejoices over that. When God sees the hurt and the pain in us, God is not just observing that, but we believe that God is actively trying to comfort us in our hurts, in our fears, trying to, to whisper to us, hey, I'm here with you. Hey, it's going to be okay. We, we believe that when God sees our brokenness, when God sees the ways in which our love is still turned inward toward ourselves, God sees that and, and coaxes us, convicts us. Hey, Michael, there's a better way than that. And God is working constantly in my sinfulness, in our sinfulness, to open ourselves up, to turn our love outward so that we follow in the very nature of God's own self whose God's love is not turned inward on God, but rather is turned out toward the universe and toward you. And so it is God coaxes us to say, there's a better way I know for you than to be turned in on yourself. It is to be turned outward. So in the first couple of verses of Psalm 139, the psalmist starts considering all the ways that God's attention is on each of us and says, this is amazing. And, I, you know, we all come at it with our own perspectives, but immediately as I started working on this sermon this week, my first thought was with the people who would be hearing this psalm, who would think initially, this is not amazing. This is very uncomfortable. This is very disquieting that God is seeing it all. 
seeing every action, every word, hearing every word, and hearing every, every idea before it becomes a word, every thought. What I think is, is interesting for the, the writer of the psalm is that immediately laying out how it is God knows all of the good, bad, and ugly about us, you know? You know when I sit and when I rise, when, you, when I go to sleep, when I wake up, you know my path, you, you're behind me and in front of me, all this kind of stuff. The psalmist goes on to say, you hem me in behind and before, meaning kind of behind me and in front of me, as I, the idea is that I'm, I'm kind of going somewhere. And then it says, you lay your hand on me. Now, depending on the vernacular of your home growing up, lay your hand on me might have multiple meanings. In Hebrew, it's very clear what this imagery is about. In the original language of the psalm, this is language, not including the hand, which, by the way, it doesn't say, you lay your hand on me, but rather it says, you place your palm upon me. Behind and before the imagery is of a potter at the wheel and a piece of clay spinning around and, and the hands surrounding, carefully fashioning this piece of clay. And, uh, you know, that imagery has some meaning to it to people of the scriptures who believe that God made the first human being out of clay with God's own hand, a work of art, a work of love, a work of care. The psalmist sees you and I and himself on this wheel being shaped by God's hand after even after seeing who we really are. That's the part that I think the psalmist finds amazing, is wait, 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 wait. You know what I thought last night as I was watching the dolphins get their butt kicked? You heard all the curse words coming out? I didn't say them out loud, Lord. God says, yeah, 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 I know you. The amazing thing is that the psalmist saw God as seeing us for who we truly are and not being shaken by it. You know, I, I've come to a place where I've gotten, I've gotten better at being tickled with people in sort of, let's say, the public sphere who seem to take a shot at God, you know, saying something negative about God, where I understand, like, you know, God, you, you can't rattle God with that. Like, why should I get rattled when God's not rattled? God can, God can handle it. There are some things that rattle God. There's no doubt about that in terms of uh, uh, quickening the heart of God, so to speak. But even still, God sees us for who we are and is not shaken away for us, from us, but rather, even when seeing the most difficult parts of who we are, those parts that we would be least inclined, say, to share with a doctor or a spouse, or in any realm where, where we might be called into vulnerability, we say, well, there's some things I'm just going to not be vulnerable with. God sees even those things and keeps God's hands on that piece of clay. Gently, caringly, purposely shaping, forming, nurturing. So, uh, again, depending on our experiences, particularly growing up, uh, our experiences with those who have been closest to us in, uh, in this life, the words of this psalm put us somewhere on a spectrum between if we, let's say we had a real stable experience, parents, close family members, as we got into adulthood, uh, you know, with our, with our spouse, with good friends, our experience was that these people, when they saw the worst in us, they didn't split. They might not have always been super psyched, about the worst parts of us, but they were with us. So if we're on that end of the spectrum with Psalm 139, we go, huh, well, this is pretty cool to see. Like God, in so many ways, acts like these people in my life. That, that just like mom and dad were faithful with me and stuck with me, even as I went through high and low and difficulty, uh, God does that same thing. My best friend who was always by my side, even when I was a jerk, God is that best friend times a billion. What a comfort. 
And then, you know, there's all kinds of gradient in the spectrum. And maybe, we, maybe we're somewhere in the middle of all the way to this other extreme, which is that a bunch of other people in my life who were supposed to be faithful to me, when they saw who I really was, or they saw that loving me was going to take sacrifice on their part because I wasn't, you know, like a superhero and they were going to have to put up with some of my idiosyncrasies. They were, it was going to be like work that those people didn't hang around when they saw what it was going to be to stay close to me. If I wasn't good enough for a parent who abandoned me, or if I wasn't good enough for a spouse who ditched me, or I wasn't good enough for a best friend who betrayed me, then how could I be worth enough for God to search me and know me and do something different than what these other people who were supposed to care for me had done? I think part of the answer, the answer to this question and it's a question we can struggle with on, in any number of ways, this idea of this great God of the universe, seven billion people on the planet. I don't know if that's accurate, by the way. However many billion people on the planet, however many billion people there have been throughout the history of the world, that God sees me, that God even pays attention to me, but then that God would not only see and pay attention, but go, I care. I want to I wanna use my stethoscope, and I want to take your temperature, and I want to measure... Uh, because I want you to be healthy. I, I care. I want to I walk alongside you. I want you to have abundant life. How, how could God do that for me? How could God care at all about who I am and what it is that I'm about? So, so part of that answer lies in the second part of the scripture that we read. I picked up in verse 13 where the psalmist said, it was you who formed my inward parts you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The psalmist saying, in part, God cares for you and remains quite interested in you and, and wants to know the best of what can become of your life because God created you. And any good creator of anything or anyone would, you know, intrinsically have that value. Any loving parent say, hey, I brought you into this world. I could take you out of it, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk with you deeper into it. God cares for you and is quite interested in you. There's a special connection between God and every individual that God has knit together. This is an important part. As we read a scripture that's so intensely introspective, intro meaning kind of like me, and then even folk God's perspective, as I came up with, focusing on God, there's this, um, there's this personal individualistic thing that can and needs to happen, but also needs to be remembered that that same connection is not just with me, but with the person next to me in the pew and the person next to me on my street and the people who are in the next city to where I live and the, the neighboring nation and all the peoples of the world. You might remember, it's one of the lesser known parts of the Jonah story. It's a fairly short story, but Jonah's called by God to go into the, the most evil country in the world Go and proclaim, God is watching, God cares about what's happening, and y'all need to change your ways. And so Jonah does this. Eventually, there's an encounter with a whale and all this stuff. But he eventually goes to Nineveh, and he does this. He walks three days through the city, and then he sits and he sulks about it. And God says, why are you sulking? And Jonah says, because I know how you are. You're so nice, and you care so much. So these people who are my arch enemies, you knit them together and you care about their lives like you care about mine. And what that means is you're going to let them off the hook, aren't you? And God says, why shouldn't I? I saved you when you were in the belly of that big fish while you were in rebellion of me. Why shouldn't I care about these hundreds of thousands of people that I also created? Their lives matter to me as well. God's search and knows each of us and loves 
each of us like a creator would their creation. But I think there's another special connection. It's not simply God says like, well, I made you and, you know, that means I got a commitment to you. I got to stick with you. There's, there's part of that. But the other, the other special thing that's reflected in these verses is this. Where God, where, where the psalmist says, uh, you formed my inward parts, which is very poetic to us. You know, that's how we read it in English. If we read it in Hebrew, here's what it would say. I formed your kidneys. Now, you can understand why the English translators would write your inward parts, because to us, we read, well, that's kind of graphic and gross, and why would you write kidneys? Well, here's why. And the translators know this, but there's, you know, there's issues with translations. Uh, the kidneys to the ancient Hebrew mind, and throughout the scriptures, if you read them in their original languages, it, you'd find multiple instances of, uh, of the kidneys being referenced. The idea is that this is the seat of a human being's conscience in the ancient way of thinking. The conscience to an ancient person isn't something here. It's deeper, like in the bowels. It's, it's here in your side. It's this it's this way of stating for the psalmist, you knit my body, but you also knit my spirit. And you, you instilled that little voice in me, that little nudge, that little whisper that would help me know right from wrong, that would help me know harm from help. You put a little bit of yourself into me. You put your perspective into me. You put your identity into me into me. God says, I made the deepest, most intricate parts of your body, and I did the same with your spirit. I care about your life because I want your life to be abundant and full and meaningful and enjoyable and have purpose and all that kind of stuff. But I also, and I also, I kind of care about how you're representing me. I, I care that my legacy lives in you. I want you to carry on my good name. I want you to carry on my good work. I, I want you to know what it is to live in the way that is my way. The, the psalmist is going through a lot of poetic work here to try and convey to us in, in some way that there's been a lot of effort and a lot of care put into our lives. And there continues to be. The psalmist, when we got toward the close of the verses that I was reading, the psalmist says, How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. And again, you know, the biblical writers are much better at writing poetically than I am. Thank goodness. That's why they're the biblical writers. God chose them and not me. But, it, you know, in Michael's uh, standard version translation of those verses, if I was giving it to you in my speech, the psalmist says, how weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. My words to you, if I was writing that, would be, it makes my brain hurt when I think about how you think, Lord. It's heavy. How? Why? What? Ugh. Because God is still thinking and still working and it's a lot to take in. It's flattering, it's comforting, it's overwhelming. So then the psalmist describes again something very poetically that I, I think is, is, is much more kind of earthy than it reads initially. The psalmist says, I try to count them, meaning your thoughts, O oh God. I'm, I'm thinking about you. I'm being Godtrospective as I'm being introspective and I'm thinking about this whole thing about kidneys and ways and potters and clay and all this stuff and who it's a lot. He says, I try to count these thoughts. They are more than the sand. Now, what, what uh, experience does that conjure up for you when you're thinking about counting something and it's, it's more than you can, it's, it's, it, it has some kind of effect on your mind and your eyelids, and your snoring. <laughs> yeah, counting sheep. And some, some people count, you know, if you, 
We, kids nowadays, some of them have these little projectors that put stars on their ceiling, and you count them. But, but the idea is sort of something that's way beyond what I can really grasp and conceive, and just counting, counting, and, and eventually fall asleep. The psalmist says, this is, I, I try and try and try. It's too many thoughts to think about, and eventually I conk out. And then we have, in English, uh, it closes where the psalmist says, I come to the end. That's what most of our translations say. Mine has a little footnote, and if you had a Bible with yours, you're my, uh, with you, yours might too. But the, the original language, more precisely here is, I wake up. I fall asleep trying to get it, Lord, and it's another day, and I've tried to get it, but I, there's no way I can fully get it. So I fell asleep, but then I wake up, and here you are, and here I am, still together. So I told you at the beginning of this whole thing, we're going to talk about something you don't really need to think about. You don't, you know, you, you'll be able to eat today, and I don't know if you're playing golf today, we'll see how the weather holds out, but... Uh, you could do what you need to do today without thinking of this stuff. The psalmist could have. There's no way you get to the end of figuring it all out. And still, there is something about this pursuit of looking inward and looking Godward and trying to just, as much as we can, understand there is this divine connection, a connection of creation and care that God has put in each of us and in this world that well, when you wake up falling asleep thinking about God and then you wake up thinking about God and saying, Still here, huh? There's something about that that can be very comforting. There's something about that, especially when we're walking through the difficult moments of life that conveys to us over and over again, I'm not alone in this. Or if it's a difficult moment, maybe, maybe your life is going just fine, but your heart aches for the pain that you see in this world. And you wake up and you remember God hadn't, God hasn't ended it yet with me or with this world. We, we go to sleep and we wake up and God is still there. I, I imagined for this morning that there's any number of people for whom some of this is old hat. Like a bunch of you, you've been in the faith for decades. You've been going to church, listening to rambling sermons and whatnot. And this is like a reminder to you, but you're like, nothing new here, pastor. Thank you. Helpful a good C-plus sermon. So to you, I say thank you for being patient. The, the, the real folks that I'm thinking about this morning are the folks who need that spark, though, who come to worship. And, and this doesn't mean I come to worship only once every year or five years or something. This could be people who come to church every single Sunday because it's what I'm supposed to do and, and I feel good about it. But as far as this introspection, getting close to God business, eh, that ain't for me. So, so I've come to church this morning and maybe I've come a bit with the apprehension that I might have of going to the doctor. And I know the doctor's going to try and poke and prod and search. And there's things I don't want the doctor poking and prodding and searching about. I, I want a little bit of distance here. I still have some of that dodge and duck and dive. And uh, I forget the five D's of dodgeball. Sorry. There's somebody who likes the movie Dodgeball. It's going to come up afterward and say, you hooked me with the Dodgeball reference. Thank you. Um, I love you. Uh, but, but there's some of us who've come to church or come to whenever it is we sort of are in these, these faith settings and we say, I want to get close, but not too close. Because if God sees the real me, God's going to be repelled by it. If God sees the real me, God's going to be as ashamed of me as I am ashamed of me. I want you to hear this morning that you can't shake God. That God has seen it all. God isn't surprised by any of it. God has seen the good and smiled on it. God has seen the hurt and comforted it. God has seen the worst in you and still believes there is hope for it to be turned into a victory for God rather than something that defines you. Now, one of the biggest obstacles here, as I close, is, is we hear these things and we think, boy, that sounds good. But look at me, I'm an old man now, 46. Life is just, <laughs> that's the oldest I've ever been. It feels quite old. <laughs> I feel very old, in fact. You substitute whatever your age is for that. 
Well, I might, I might encounter God and say, God, I'm an old man. I should have come to these realizations years ago. It's, it's too late for me. There, there's an ancient proverb I love that says, if you want shade, the best time to have planted a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time, right now. Yeah, maybe 20 years ago passed you by. God doesn't waste anything. Plant that seed today. Turn deeper. Embrace more closely the reality that God isn't just seeing you on Sundays and you need to reintroduce yourself every time. Hey, God, it's me, Michael. Good to see you again. God's like, I know who you are, you turkey. I'm with you. When you go to sleep and when you wake up, I'm with you. When you sit down, when you rise up, when you're walking, I'm not only with you, my palm is on your life, forming, shaping, nudging, whispering, caring. Friends, today's the day of salvation. When the scripture says that, saying, yeah, 20 years ago might have passed, but today is the day that you can turn toward God and you can embrace the reality that you are searched and known and that God hadn't abandoned you yet. And God won't. Let's pray. Lord your, Lord, your faithfulness is more than we can really grasp. It, your thoughts, they are too weighty for us. And still, Lord, you would convey to us repeatedly, not only through the words of certain psalms, not only through certain stories in the Bible, but through Jesus Christ himself. Lord, you, you share with us that we are yours and you are ours. That you care about us, that you love us so deeply that you would do anything, that you would give anything to, to rebuild that connection which had been broken. That you, that you want to walk beside us in this life that you want to talk with us, that you want us to share in communion with you and with each other. Lord, what a gift. We can't believe that we get to be a part of your world, a part of your love, have your time, have your attention, have your healing. Lord, I ask this morning that you would grant to each of us what is needed most in this moment. If it is comfort, if it is to be challenged, if it is to be affirmed, whatever it would be, Lord, you know us better than we know ourselves. You know our needs better than we know them ourselves. But for each person today, Lord, including me, would there be something divine that occurs within our innermost parts, that our conscience, your very uh, identity within us, that it would speak to us as we need. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.